This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 74. Coming up on Space Time, discovery of a cometary gateway to the inner solar system. ASA, the Australian Space Agency, signs a formal agreement to work closely with NASA. And the majesty of the Magellanic Clouds and three meteor showers are among the highlights of the October night skies on Skywatch. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Science's understanding of how comets are funneled into the inner solar system may have fundamentally changed following the discovery of what's being described as an orbital gateway. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters are based on computer simulations of the orbits of centaurs. Centaurs are small icy bodies traveling in chaotic orbits between the giants of the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. The authors model the evolution of bodies from beyond Neptune's orbit through the giant planet's region and inside Jupiter's orbit. These icy bodies are often considered to be nearly pristine remnants of the builder's rubble left over from the birth of our solar system. For a long time, the pathway of comets from their original formation location inwards towards the Sun has been highly debated. The study's lead author, Gal Sarid, from the University of Central Florida, says astronomers have always wanted to know how new comets, controlled by Jupiter's influence, replace those that are lost, and also where the transition lies between residing in the outer solar system's small dormant bodies and becoming active inner solar system bodies, exhibiting a widespread gas and dust coma and tail. Centaurs are thought to originate in the Kuiper Belt region beyond Neptune, a ring of icy worlds, comets and debris which orbit the outer regions around the Sun. They're considered the source of Jupiter family comets, which occupy the inner solar system. But the chaotic nature of centaur orbits obscures their exact pathways, making it difficult to predict their future as comets. When icy bodies such as centaurs or comets approach the sun, they begin to release gas and dust to produce the fuzzy appearance of the coma and the extended tails that are so characteristic of comets. The original goal of this study was to explore the history of one specific centaur, 29P Vassmann Weichmann 1, or SW1 for short, a mid-sized centaur in a nearly circular orbit just beyond that of Jupiter. SW1's long puzzled astronomers because of its high level of activity and frequent explosive outbursts, which are occurring some distance from the sun well beyond the snow line, where ice shouldn't effectively vaporize. Both its orbit and activity puts SW1 in an evolutionary middle ground between other centaurs and Jupiter family comets. The authors wanted to explore whether SW1 circumstances were consistent with the orbital progression of other centaurs. More than one in five centaurs were found to enter an orbit similar to that of SW1 at some point in their lifetime. But rather than being a peculiar outlier, SW1 appears to be a centaur caught in the act of dynamically evolving into a Jupiter family comet. And the author's computer simulations uncovered an even bigger surprise. It seems centaurs passing through this region are the source of more than two-thirds of all Jupiter family comets, making this the primary gateway through which these comets are produced. Mind you, this gateway region doesn't hold centaurs for long. The simulations suggest that they become Jupiter family comets within a few thousand years. That's the blink of an eye in cosmic terms. So the presence of this gateway provides a long sought-after means of identifying centaurs on an imminent trajectory towards the inner solar system. As for SW1, well it's currently the largest and most active of the handful of objects discovered in this gateway region, and that makes it a prime candidate to advance science's knowledge of the orbital and physical transitions that shape the cometary population. I'm Stuart Gary, you're listening to Space Time. ASA, the Australian Space Agency, has signed a formal agreement to work closely with NASA on future robotic and manned missions, including America's return to the Moon and eventually Mars and beyond. The deal was announced during a state visit to Washington by the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. It'll see ASA invest more than $150 million over the next five years, helping to develop new technologies that will support NASA's Moon and Mars missions, including Project Artemis to return astronauts to the Moon by 2024 and the Lunar Gateway Space Station project. That should see an orbiting outpost between the Earth and Moon by 2028. Morrison says his government wants to triple the size of Australia's space sector to around $12 billion, creating around 20,000 extra jobs by 2030. The agreement was formally signed at a special ceremony at NASA headquarters in Washington. Although ASA was only established a little over a year ago, Australia has had a long tradition of working closely with the United States on space missions. 
A formal agreement between NASA and the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization, the CSIRO, dates back to the 1960s, allowing for the tracking and communications of NASA missions through the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex at Tidbin Villa, as well as data relay satellite facilities at Pine Gap near Alice Springs and at Dongara in Western Australia. Morrison says Australia has partnered with the United States in almost all NASA missions over the past 60 years, and this investment paves the way for the next 60. Earlier this year, ASA signed a similar agreement with the European Space Agency. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. Australia's gift to NASA, which has gone down like a lead balloon in the local media, I might add. What have we given to NASA, Fred? That's the interesting bit because, uh, yes, it's a, it's a gift to NASA of $150 million spread over five years from the Australian government via the Australian Space Agency to support NASA's plans for trips to Mars in, in the end. And, uh, of course, the moon as well, which is a, regarded as a stepping stone to Mars. However, it's interestingly, you know, yes, it's a gift to NASA, but really it's a gift to Australia because the deal, I think, means that um, most of that money will probably come back to Australian industry. So it's, it's all about uh, engaging Australian in- industry to support NASA with technology and with, um, you know, some of, the, some of the ideas that are needed to bring about exploration in NASA. There's a headline I read today about some of the, the autonomous vehicles that are used in the mining industry mm. have you know, they've got characteristics that might be useful in developing vehicles that might be able to explore Mars. I mean, NASA's got a pretty good track record on that with three very successful rovers. In fact, four, if you include, I think it was Pathfinder. As against Indiga, um, but, you know, that's another story. Well, yeah, but no, that's right. I mean, I, I think uh, I, I think it's a, an interesting area of of research and I think it, I think it is actually a good thing that uh, we in Australia are visibly supporting NASA's you know NASA's work in that it is of course only 0.7 of a percent of NASA's annual budget that we've given to them but that's all right that's still going to make a difference <laughs> of course uh, and of course you know the the, the negative uh, press that sort of uh, came along with this announcement um, is obviously based on on very narrow focus you now why aren't you putting that money into the drought instead etc cetera, etc cetera. but um you know th- we've got to be there for the future yeah. we've got to be involved in space travel and space exploration and space industry uh, otherwise we're going to be a very lonely country in in the long term future so mm. uh it and, and you know in the scheme of things 150 million dollars not a lot out of our budget either i think one of the uh you know, one, one of the, one of the telling statements came from Andy Thomas, uh, Australia's uh, first astronaut. Actually, he's not. He's, he wasn't Australia's first astronaut, but uh, that was Paul Scully Power, but uh, a, a well-known Australian astronaut, now retired. And Andy made the point that you know he's been a big supporter of the Australian Space a- Agency, uh, was instrumental in getting it going, instrumental in um, the fact that it's moving, it's going to be based. Uh, its permanent base will be in Adelaide. It's currently based in Canberra, but will move to Adelaide probably around the end of the year. But he, his comment was, it's great to see the space industry, uh, sorry, the space agency engaging with human space flight, because most of what we do in Australia in the space, you know, in terms of uh, space presence is about uh, scientific and industrial applications, but not necessarily human spaceflight, whereas this is definitely uh, directed towards that goal. So it, it's expanding the, you know, the, the horizons of the space agency in, I think, quite a good way. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you'd like to help support Space Time and the great work we do promoting science, then why not come and join our Patreon family? For just a few dollars a month, you'll get access to a slick commercial-free double-episode version of Space Time every week, as well as extended interviews not included in the show, and an invitation to join our special Patreon-only Facebook group We can come and chat, discuss the show, ask questions, whatever you want with like-minded listeners and our team. You can get all the details at patreon.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary, where you can see the various reward levels we have and what works for you. And of course, most importantly, you'll be helping to support our show and the work we do to deliver the wonders of the universe to everyone. Now that URL again is patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, 
patreon.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. And of course, you can find the details in the show notes or just click the orange button on our website. And thanks to all our patrons because it's your generosity and support that helps keep our show going. Japan has finally launched its latest HTV cargo ship loaded with supplies and equipment bound for the International Space Station. The HTV-8 Kunatori, or White Stork in Japanese, was launched aboard an H-2B rocket from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's Tanegashima Space Center in southwestern Japan. Sitting on the pad of Site 2 of the launch complex is the H-2 trans- transfer vehicle called HTV on its eighth mission, HTV-8, sitting on top of an H-2B rocket. Everything's still on track. Ten seconds to launch. D zero and lift off of the HTV eight and the H two B rocket carrying its way four tons of cargo to the International Space Station. Lighting up the night sky over southern Japan. Everything looking good through the flight so far. Those four strap on solid rocket boosters will carry the vehicle through the first one minute fifty four seconds of the launch. The operation control of the launch vehicle has been switched from the blockhouse to the range control center. 20 more seconds before those solid rocket boosters burn out. Everything looking good so far. The vehicle itself uh, heading towards the southeast to get in the right phasing to meet up with the International Space Station. The solid rocket boosters uh, beginning to burn out. We should see them separate in pairs as the first pair of solid rocket boosters separating and the second pair. Now that core stage will continue to burn until 5 minutes 47 seconds into the flight, burning liquid fuel, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And confirmation that that first stage did successfully cut off second stage burning now. This second stage will burn for well over 8 minutes. Minutes, 8 minutes, 19 seconds. Second stage has cut off. Now just waiting for confirmation of physical separation between the HTV and the second stage. And confirmation of separation. The launch took place just as the space station was flying over Mali in Western Africa. The cargo ship rendezvousing with the orbiting outpost four days later. It was then captured by the space station's robotic arm and docked with the Earth-facing port of the Harmony module where it will remain for a month. Kunatori is delivering some 5.3 tonnes of supplies, including fresh food and water, as well as six new lithium-ion batteries and corresponding adapter plates to replace the station's ageing nickel-hydrogen batteries for two power channels on the space station's far port truss segment. The batteries will be installed through a series of robotics and spacewalks by the space station's crew over the next few months. Inside the pressurized logistics carrier is about over 5,000 pounds of cargo, and in the unpressurized segment is just over 3,000 pounds of the lithium-ion batteries and associated adapter plates that will be part of a series of upgrades to replace the aging nickel-hydrogen batteries that are on the outside of the station and store the power provided by the station's solar arrays and be replaced with the newer lithium-ion batteries. The exposed pallet is actually accessible once HTV is docked to the International Space Station. It's accessible robotically. The manifest also includes new scientific equipment to upgrade the cell biology experiment facility, a small-sized satellite optical communication system, and the hourglass experiment to test the effects of gravity on powder and granular materials, including simulants for lunar, Mars, and Phobos regolith, alumina beads, and silica sands. The flight had been delayed by several weeks after a fire broke out on the launch pad shortly before the original scheduled liftoff. It's thought the fire was caused by static electricity generated as liquid oxygen from the rocket came into contact with heat-resistant material on the launch pad. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for October on Skywatch. October is the 10th month of the year, which may seem confusing as octo in Latin means 8 rather than 10. Of course, the answer lies in the old Roman calendar, which had just 10 months. That's before the addition of January and February. And as we mentioned before, that 10-month calendar is still reflected today, with names like September or Septum, Latin for 7, October or Octo meaning 8, November or Novem 9, and December or Deci meaning 10. Looking to the southwest this time of the year, you'll see the two bright pointer stars of the Southern Cross. These two bright stars, one above the other, are known as the pointers, and the two stars help us find the Southern Cross. The Southern Cross, of course, is the best-known constellation in southern skies. The brightest, and also what looks like the furthest away from the Southern Cross, is Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system to our own solar system. 
Alpha Centauri is a triple star system comprising two stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, which orbit each other in a binary system, and a third star, Proxima Centauri, which orbits the pair. Like the Sun, Alpha Centauri A is a spectral type G yellow dwarf star. It's about 10% more massive than the Sun and about one and a half times as luminous. Its binary partner, Alpha Centauri B, is a spectral type K orange dwarf star, a little smaller and a little cooler than its companion, with about 90% of the Sun's mass and about half its luminosity. This pair, Alpha Centauri A and B, orbit each other at between 11.2 and 35.6 astronomical units, an astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which equates to about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. So the pair's orbit around each other varies between the average distance between Saturn and the Sun and between Pluto and the Sun. The two stars orbit each other over 79.91 Earth years, and the average distance between this pair and our Sun is 4.37 light years. Now, it sounds like a measure of time, but of course a light year is actually a measure of distance. A light year is a distance of about 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at the speed of light, which is about 300,000 kilometres per second in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. The third star in the Alpha Centauri system is a spectral type M red dwarf star called Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is just 4.25 light years away from the Earth, making it the nearest star to the Earth other than the Sun. It's loosely gravitationally bound to Alpha Centauri A and B, orbiting the pair at an average distance of about 13,000 astronomical units, or 0.21 light years. That's about 430 times the size of Neptune's orbit around our Sun. In 2016, astronomers confirmed the existence of an Earth-sized terrestrial planet orbiting in the habitable zone around Proxima Centauri, making it the nearest known extrasolar or exoplanet to Earth. The planet, known as Proxima b, takes just 11 Earth days to complete one orbit around its host star, far closer than Mercury's 88 Earth day orbit around the Sun. The second and slightly fainter of the two pointer stars is Beta Centauri. And while Alpha Centauri is the third brightest star in the night sky, outshone only by Sirius and Canopus, Beta Centauri is the tenth brightest star. Looking towards the southeast, you'll see the bright blue-white star Alpha Aridini or Achenar, which represents the southern tip of Eridanus, one of the largest and longest constellations in the sky. Achenar is located about 139 light years away. It's a binary star system comprising two stars, Alpha Aridini A and Alpha Aridini B. Alpha Aridini A is a young hot spectral type B blue star, about 6.7 times the mass of the Sun, with a stunning 3,150 times the Sun's luminosity. The companion star, Alpha Aridini B, appears to be a spectral type A white star, about twice the mass of the Sun. The two stars orbit each other every 14 to 15 Earth years, at an average distance of about 12.3 astronomical units. Because of its high rotation rate of over 16 kilometers per second, Alpha Aridini A is one of the least known spherical stars in the Milky Way, spinning so rapidly it's assumed the shape of an oblate spheroid, with an equatorial diameter 56% greater than its polar diameter. This distorted shape means the star displays significant latitudinal temperature variations, with its polar temperature being above 20,000 Kelvin, while its equatorial temperature is only around 10,000 Kelvin, because it's much further away from the stellar core. The high polar temperatures are generating a fast polar wind ejecting matter from the star and creating a polar envelope of hot gas and plasma. Located between the south celestial pole and Achenar this time of the year, you'll see two faint fuzzy looking clouds. Now, these aren't really clouds, but two satellite dwarf galaxies which orbit the Milky Way known as the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. They're named after Ferdinand Magellan, who became the first European to officially record them during his expedition to circumnavigate the Earth between 1519 and 1522. The bigger and nearer of the pair, the Large Magellanic Cloud, is located about 160 light years away. It's easy to spot about halfway between Achenar and the horizon. It's about 14,000 light years across, roughly twice that of the Small Magellanic Cloud, which is located a more distant 200,000 light years from the Milky Way. Now, for comparison, our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. The large and small Magellanic clouds are separated from each other by about 75,000 light years. They were considered the closest galaxies to the Milky Way. That was until 1994 and the discovery of the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical Galaxy, and then the 2003 confirmation that the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy is actually our nearest galactic neighbour. The total mass of the Magellanic clouds is uncertain. 
Only a fraction of their gas seems to have coalesced into stars, and they probably both have really huge dark matter halos. One recent estimate for the total mass of the Large Magellanic Cloud is about one-tenth that of the Milky Way. Both Magellanic Clouds have been greatly distorted by gravitational tidal interactions as they're gradually being torn apart and absorbed by the Milky Way. These huge tidal forces have turned both Magellanic Clouds into irregularly disrupted barred spiral galaxies. The Large Magellanic Cloud retains a very clear spiral structure in radio telescope images of neutral hydrogen. But of course, gravity isn't a one-way street, and the combined gravitational forces of both Magellanic Clouds are also affecting the Milky Way, distorting the outer parts of our galaxy's disk. There are massive streams of neutral hydrogen gas clouds and isolated stars now connecting both dwarf galaxies to each other and to the Milky Way itself. This is all a clear example of galactic cannibalism in action, how larger galaxies slowly consume smaller ones to increase their own size. Now, if you look just above the small Magellanic Cloud through a backyard telescope or a good pair of binoculars, you'll see a small blurry dot. That's the 47 Tucani Globular Cluster, tightly packed ball of stars some 16,000 light years away that were all originally formed at the same time through the gravitational collapse of the same molecular gas and dust cloud. Looking to the west, you'll see the bright reddish-orange supergiant Antares in the heart of the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion. And above it, you'll see a bunch of stars stretching out shaped like a reverse question mark. That's the tail of the Scorpion. And just above that, to the north, you'll see the constellation of Sagittarius, the Archer. Sagittarius shows the way to the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, located some 26,000 light years away. This monster black hole, called Sagittarius A star, has about 4.3 million times the mass of the Sun. Looking to the north-northwest this time of year, you see the constellation Lyra the Harp and its brightest star Vega. Vega is the fifth brightest star in the night sky, and it's also one of the closest, just 25 light years away. Vega is a spectral type A white star, with about twice the size and 40 times the mass of our Sun. Just to the right of Lyra, and almost directly due north, just above the horizon, is the constellation of Cygnus the Swan, and its brightest star Deneb, which happens to be one of the most luminous stars in the sky. Deneb is a massive spectral type A blue-white supergiant, some 19 times the mass, and more than 100 times the diameter of our Sun. The star is somewhere between 55,000 and 196,000 times as luminous as the Sun. The huge range in luminosity estimates is caused by the difficulty in determining Deneb's exact distance from us. Science's best estimates are placing it around 2,600 light-years away, give or take 212 light-years. High in the northern sky this time of the year is Aquila the Eagle and its brightest star, Altair. Altair is another close neighbour, a spectral type A white star located just 17 light-years away. It's about 10 times brighter than the Sun, and has some 1.89 times the Sun's mass. Despite its size, Altair spins on its axis in just 10 hours, compared to the Sun's 28-day rotation. Now, the three stars we've just mentioned, Altair, Deneb and Vega, form what's known as the Summer Triangle, a stellar grouping. There are three meteor showers in October, the Draconids, the Taurids and the Orionids. The Draconids are happening right now. They're so named because their meteors appear to radiate out of the constellation of Draco the Dragon, and so they're best viewed from the Northern Hemisphere. Produced as Earth's orbit takes it through the debris trail left behind by the comet 21P, Geobini Zinner, which takes about 6.6 .6 years to complete each revolution around the Sun. The Taurids meteor shower happens tomorrow, October the 10th, and as the name suggests, it's made up of meteors which appear to radiate out from the constellation Taurus the Bull. These meteors are composed of larger-than-average sized pebbles and dust grains and are thought to be generated by debris from the comet 2P Enki, although it's thought both the Taurids and Enki could be the remains of a much earlier comet which disintegrated sometime over the past 20,000 to 30,000 years, breaking into several pieces and releasing material through normal cometary activity and possibly also by gravitational tidal interactions with the Earth and other planets. In fact, the Taurus debris stream is the largest in the inner solar system, taking the Earth several weeks to pass through and resulting in an extended period of meteor activity compared to other meteor showers, which are usually over in a matter of days. Due to the gravitational perturbations of the planets, especially Jupiter, the Taurids are spread out over time, allowing separate segments labelled as the northern Taurids and the southern Taurids to be observable at different times in different hemispheres. 
The southern Torahs are active from around September the 10th through to November the 20th, while the northern Torahs are active from around October the 20th through to December the 10th. Our third meteor shower this month will be the Orionids, which will peak on October the 20th. They're caused by debris left behind by the Comet Halley, which also causes the Eta Acarids meteor shower in May. Comet Halley takes 76 years to complete each orbit of the Sun, and it will next be visible from the Earth in 2061. The Orionids are equally spectacular in both northern and southern hemisphere skies, with up to 20 meteors an hour radiating out from the constellation Orion. The best time to see the Orionids is just after midnight and right before dusk. OK, and now to complete our tour of the October night skies, we're joined by Jonathan Nally from Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Well, I love this time of year. It's, it's really good for stargazing. You've got the evenings. I've just been out for a walk, actually, and, and the evenings are, are really lovely. They're, they're not too cold, not too hot, uh, nice and clear. Um, the nights are still long because we haven't yet reached into the summer months here in the Southern Hemisphere where the nights become short and stargazing time is limited. So it's a beautiful time of the year for stargazing. So as I said, I've just been out having a look and we're up nice and high in the sort of western half of the sky. We've got the Milky Way, the band of stars, that which is our galaxy, seen from the inside, stretching from the north to the south all the way across the western half of the sky. It's really beautiful. You've got this, the constellation Sagittarius there and, and Scorpius, which really does look like a scorpion if you look at it from the right way up. They're really easily visible out there in the west. But come about midnight or so, the Milky Way will have disappeared and those constellations are gone. That They'll have set below the horizon because the Earth, of course, is turning all the time and things are setting in the west and coming up in the east. So that means that sort of very late evening and into the sort of midnight hours, when we look up into the night sky this time of year, we're looking out of the plane of our galaxy, not through the, the middle of our galaxy looking at all the stars. So we're looking out with much more empty space and far fewer stars. So it might seem a little bit bare, but, but don't worry, there's still plenty of good things to see. For us down the southern hemisphere, for instance, we're coming into the time of year when the Magellanic Clouds are best seen. Now, these are the two nearest sizable galaxies outside our Milky Way. They're satellite galaxies of our Milky Way, and they're named after the explorer Magellan because Magellan, during his round-the-world trip, spotted them. They had been seen, of course, before by indigenous populations, but he was a European who came down south, spotted these faint, fuzzy clouds in the sky. He didn't know what they, he didn't know they were galaxies, of course, but they became known as the uh, Magellanic Clouds. Magellan didn't make it back on that mission, but um, anyway, his name lives on. It's the Philippines, wasn't it, where he, uh, where he met his demise? Yeah, he got about three-quarters of the way, didn't he? And, um, yeah, met his demise, as lots of, lots of explorers did, I suppose, yet. Up in the sky there, he's, uh, he's now immortal, I suppose. We have the Magellanic Clouds. So they're down there, down south, about halfway up from the horizon. So there, there are two of them. There, there's a small cloud and a large cloud. You'll need dark skies to spot them. But when you do, you'll be really impressed. You look up and you think, oh, they aren't clouds. They are actually galaxies. It's amazing to be able to think you can see galaxies with your own naked eye. Both disrupted spirals, we think. Yeah, they, they have some sort of spiral shape to them. So um, it's really interesting that we, our view or impression of the Magellanic Clouds has changed in the last, say, 30 years or so from sort of oddity, sort of not fitting into, into any real category type galaxies. Irregular. To, yeah, probably, probably a uh, disrupted sort of spirals. Yeah, and so, uh, uh, we wonder whether or not it's the Milky Way that's doing the disrupting. We think it is. Yeah, it probably is because the Milky Way is much, much bigger, of course, has much And you've got the gravity. Magellanic streams. So uh, the yeah. star trail is going from the small to the large and then from the large to the Milky Way. So Milky Way is eh, thieving stars off them as we speak. Yeah, well, the Milky Way has gobbled up lots of galaxies in the past. Astronomers have um, identified lots of stars in our galaxy that are moving in a way that clearly indicates that they came from outside our galaxy so it's just like anything in life you know fish in the sea or whatever uh, the, the big ones gobble up the little ones and that's the way it goes when we think of galaxies being cannibals and eating other galaxies we think this is a really violent event but uh, it's happening right now on the other side of the milky way where we have the sagittarius dwarf galaxy being consumed by the milky way and uh, we don't even notice it here on this side of the galaxy oh no we're a long long way away and, and even if you were there you probably wouldn't notice a great mm. deal because it takes it takes a very long time it's a very slow process and you think if two galaxies come together then you have lots of stars crashing into each other but no the the space between the stars is just so vast that they just sort of slide past each other it's quite gentle really Indeed. But, uh, but but in the big scheme of things yeah galaxies do collide all the time yeah, over you know long periods of time in that's how they grow that's how they grow in galactic terms yeah so anyway there's the two magellanic clouds now uh what about the southern cross now if you're looking for the southern cross and you can't find it and you think you're going mad well you're not don't panic at the moment 
it's upside down and right down on the southern horizon for sort of most of the populated areas of the southern latitude. You've got to go a bit further south. You've got to go to say to Melbourne or Hobart or the equivalent um, latitudes in South America or, or um, Africa before you, you'll see the Southern Cross at this time of year at the moment. Because so I say it's right down towards the south, standing on its head. Uh, on the horizon. So if you've got any trees and things in the way, you're not going to see it. Now, if you like staying up late or you like getting up early, the skies after midnight in October are really, really, really good because coming up in the east after midnight are some of the, all the best constellations. They're the ones that herald that for us down here in the south, summer is coming. For our friends in the northern hemisphere, it means winter is coming. Uh, and these constellations are, let me let me rattle them off. You've got Orion, you've got Taurus, you've got Gemini, you've got Canis Major, you've got down here in the south, you've got Puppis and all these other ones, which are amazing galaxies in the, in the sort of midst of the Milky Way. So there's stacks and stacks of stars, lots and lots of deep sky objects like uh, nebulae and those sorts of things and a really fascinating part of the sky. So it's, it's, it's really good this time of year because we know that in a couple of months' time, these things won't be coming up in the early morning. They will be coming up in the evening and we'll have plenty of stuff to see. So for instance, you know, Canis Major, I mentioned, that's got the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, Orion, we've spoken about many times with its famous Orion Nebula. It's a really good time of year for all sorts of reasons. I love this time of year. Now, as far as the planets go, as the sun sets or after the sun has set in the west, you'll see Venus and Mercury very low down in the west. Now, Venus is the large bright one. Uh, you can't miss it really. And ab above it, smaller and not quite so bright is Mercury. Higher still, further up in the sky, you've got Jupiter, which is really high in the western sky in the mid-evening after the sun has set. I mean, you really can't miss it. After Venus has set and it's down below the horizon, you can't see it anymore. After Venus has gone, Jupiter is the brightest light in the sky at the moment. Not quite so bright, but still fairly bright, and a little bit higher still up in the sky is Saturn. So if you're going up from the horizon, you go a fair way up, you've got Jupiter, and then a little bit further. In fact, almost overhead for someone around the latitude of, of Sydney this month, you'll see Saturn just almost overhead there. It has a yellowish tinge, whereas Jupiter seems a really bright white. And what else? Well, we've got Mars. Mars has been around the other side of the sun as seen from Earth, so it's been hidden in the solar glare. It's been lost in the glare of the sun. It will reappear this month, but very, very low down on the eastern horizon before sunrise. And I mean really low. It's going to be hard to see, if not impossible to see, depending on how clear your horizon is. So give it time. It'll be a lot more visible in late November and then going into December. So Mars has been around the other side of the sun, so uh, when, when that happens for one of those outer planets when it's around the other side of the sun, we can't see it, of course, because the sun's in the way and the solar glare just drowns everything out. But, you know, very often some of the outer planets, whether it's Mars or Jupiter or Saturn or Uranus or Neptune, are not on the other side of the sun. They're on the same side as we are. And what we find is that as the Earth is racing around on a sort of an inside orbit, going faster than they do, uh, going around our orbit, uh, we sort of tend to lap them on the inside lane, if you like. And from periodically, we reach a point what's called opposition, which is where the Sun, the Earth, and one of these outer planets are all in a line, at least in a line if you look down on them vertically. They might not be in a line if you look at them horizontally, you know, look at the solar system horizontally, but they're in a sort of a basically a direct line out from the Sun. That's called opposition because the planet that you're talking about is on the opposite side to the Earth as the Sun is. And right now, Neptune in that sort of position. So Neptune is in that position roughly at the moment and so too is Uranus. You know you can fit 63 Earths inside it, 64 if you relax. Uh, so what you're alluding to there, uh, Stuart, is the pronunciation of this planet in our solar system, <laughs> the planet Uranus. NASA says it's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> he does it again. There he goes. Moving right along, I remember this discussion being a big back in about 1985, uh, would you believe it? And why 1985, Stuart? Why in 85? Because the Voyager 2 probe was coming up to the planet Uranus in in uh, early uh, 86. So um, you're saying astronomers got to probe deeper into it? The flyby of Voyager 2 happened within a few days, I think it was, of the Challenger explosion, which is why people remember the Challenger explosion, but they don't remember the Voyager 2 flyby of, um, of Uranus. And as I was saying, the, uh, there was a lot of discussion, particularly in America, about well, we've got to teach our young school kids about this. How are we going to pronounce this word? <laughs> And that, Stuart, is uh, October's Night Sky. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. 
You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 